This is Gospel Bound, a podcast from the Gospel Coalition for those searching for resolute hope in an anxious age. Wherever you're listening from, welcome. I'm your host, Colin Hansen, and I'm glad you're here for today's conversation. Maybe you've seen a sign in your neighbor's yard that reads something like this. In this house, we believe that black lives matter, love is love, gay rights are civil rights, women's rights are human rights, transgender women are women. If the we believe format and propositions sound familiar, that's because they are. It's a, it's a creed, albeit a secular one, without reference to transcendent moral authority, whether divine or historical. Rebecca McLaughlin's provocative new book, The Secular Creed, Engaging Five Contemporary Claims, published by the Gospel Coalition, helps us disentangle the beliefs Christians gladly affirm from those they cannot embrace. And she invites us to talk with our neighbors about the things that matter most, what we're willing to fight for, our vision of the good life for ourselves and others. Many non-Christians believe these statements will make unity and peace possible, But McLaughlin shows why Christianity is the original source and firmest foundation for true diversity, equality, and life-transforming love. Rebecca, thank you for joining me on Gospel Bound. It's a pleasure to virtually be here. (laughs) Uh, Rebecca, how did this particular kind of creed that we see in various iterations on these yard signs develop? Just as I look at it, it's not obvious how these topics hang together. I think that is something that folks are only just now starting to realize a little bit. But honestly, I think where where most people are today, most of our our neighbors, most probably if they're not Christians, and actually many increasingly folks are identifying it as Christians, are starting to see all of these kinds of claims as linked up together. So the the gay rights movement being seen as the civil rights movement and the, the current concerns around transgender rights being very much linked to the gay rights movement And what was fascinating to me as I sat down to write this book and just to to try to process more clearly and and specifically, even for myself, how these ideas got tangled up, it became clearer and clearer to me that part of where we Christians, I think, have have gone wrong, at least those of us who identify as white evangelicals, which is a category I put myself in, is not recognizing that the failure really of, of white Christians to repent of totally unbiblical racism and racial oppression over many centuries here has actually then led to the tangling up of ideas that we see today. I think it's really easy for us to think, well, these ideas have all got tangled up by folks outside the church over there. And in fact, in important ways, I I think it's actually been down to us that that we've done this tangling up and that the the failure of of white Christians historically and, and all too often today to recognize black people as their their neighbors and their equals before God has resulted in the the tangling up of ideas to where folks can say, you know, just as the white Christian segregationists of the 60s appeal to the Bible to justify their racism, so today Christians appeal to the Bible to justify their homophobia. Yeah, and we know that just historically speaking, the transition from the 1960s, the civil rights movement, opposed very strongly by so many churches, especially in the American South. We lead straight into then gay rights, the sexual revolution in general, which I guess is overlapping really, but continuing from there. And uh, so it's not a kind of shock, I guess, that those things would be linked up in people's minds. And we know that that's not a fair assessment of Christianity, certainly not global Christianity, not the black church for the most part, not even a lot of other evangelical churches. Um, But in terms of how people link together religion and politics in general um, and political platforms, I suppose we shouldn't be surprised by that. And I guess that's why I'm I'm so thankful for your book. how, How do we then begin to disentangle these diverse claims Is it possible then for us to affirm some of them, or at least one of them, and reject others? I I think it's not just possible. I think it's absolutely vital. And I think the way that we should go about sorting through these claims is picking up our Bibles, opening them and reading and seeing seeing what it says. Because I think when we do, we'll find that the Bible gives us very clear direction when it comes to racial justice, equality, and, and actually integration as well. 
Uh, so that first claim that Black Lives Matter is something, as I put it in the book, it's actually a Jesus song. It's not something that is told to us primarily by, by secular progressive folk. It's actually something that springs right out of the scriptures to us. And for those of us, if, if folks feel uncomfortable using that precise formulation because of some of the other things that, that an organization bearing that name believes as well, I'd suggest adding words to Jesus. So Black Lives Matter to Jesus. We can, all of us, I hope, if we identify as Christians, wave that flag proudly, actually. And, and in many ways, I think it's to, to our shame, those of us who identify as, as white evangelicals, it's to our shame that that sounds like, in many years, a, a secular progressive mantra. And it's because I think we haven't been singing Jesus' songs loud enough. <laughs> uh, so I think if we look at our Bibles, we'll, we'll see from the very beginning, actually, in Genesis, when God makes humans in his image, and then through the Gospels, through the New Testament epistles, right all the way into the book of Revelation, where we see people from every tribe and tongue and nation worshipping Jesus together, we'll see this, this vision of racial equality and integration, where we're called to be not separate but equal, but actually one body together with people from all sorts of different racial and eth ethnic backgrounds. This is a, something that I think, as Christians, we need to really reclaim by looking at the Bible for ourselves. But just as the Bible pulls us very strongly and gives us very clear direction about racial justice, equality and integration that often Christians have failed to take note of. So actually also the Bible gives us very clear direction about any sexual or romantic relationships outside male-female marriage and that it pulls us actually in the, the opposite direction on those questions. But the, the way that it, the reason today I think that so much of these um, issues have got tangled up in people's minds is, is because of Christian sin of, of failing to follow through on the, what the Bible says about racial justice and equality to, to make it a, a very compelling argument that, that's to say that, you know, just as the white 60s segregationists opposed interracial marriage, for example, so now Christians today oppose gay marriage. And I, I think sometimes repentance can feel for people like a step back uh, or a um, concession to the, the secular values of, of those around us, I think actually it's really a step forward that if we can, as the majority white church, I guess, writ large, if, if we can make it our business to privately and publicly repent of racial injustice, then actually we're A, much closer to what the Bible is calling us to, and B, we're actually in a better position to say, hey, this is why what we're saying today also comes out of scriptures when it comes to sexuality and isn't just us taking our, our own prejudices and trying to map them onto our sacred text. Yeah, this is something, Rebecca, that I remember talking with you about for years. And I, you and I just agree completely on this, the need for the church to go backward so that we can go forward. To go backward, especially on racial issues, so that we can go forward across the board, but especially on sexual issues, uh, which are such a significant uh, challenge right now. Yeah, it's a little bit like I, I learned to drive a car on my husband's uh, very old manual sort of stick shift car. And one of the things that was awkward for me to figure out was sort of how to do that, that strange shifting thing where you, you pull the, the gear stick back before you can move it up into the next gear. And, and that's a metaphor that I, I use in the book because I think often we're in automatic mode where we think, okay, we just want to move forward here. And things like, you know, concerns about racial justice can feel for some like a kind of distraction to gospel priorities. I actually think we can't get into the next gear up when it comes to being the body of Christ on earth in this place. I don't think we can get there without actually doing that work of, of pulling back in order to move forward together with brothers and sisters of different racial and, and ethnic backgrounds. Yeah, and all you have to do is look at your local university and look at the much talked about critical studies and see that some of the common threads that are often identified between racial studies, gender studies, and all that kind of stuff, and the confusion that can result from all of that different uh, confusing of those of those categories in there. And so we we hear so much sort of castigation, but I think it's ultimately confusion about critical theory. I found a really helpful perspective recently reading a, an African-American author, one of my favorite authors who I've known for a long time and followed for a long time, but he was talking about how the jump to condemn critical theory and say, well, we know that social justice is not biblical justice. He said, 
that might be a compelling argument if we could point to some examples of Christians doing a good job with biblical justice. But so often, pretty much the conversation goes, well, that's not biblical justice. Yeah, but then what is it? Right. And I think this is where I, I come back to that metaphor of if when we hear anyone talking about racial justice or anyone saying Black Lives Matter, if, if our first response to to something like that, however it's it's formulated in, in terms of words, is to think, oh, I feel kind of anxious. This is some sort of secular progressive or even kind of Christian progressive push. We should have been singing that song so loud. I mean, it's heartbreaking to think many of us who identify as Christians will look back to you know folks like um, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King and see him as a, as a hero, which, which he is. But when you think about it, if Christians had actually been following the scriptures on racial justice, there wouldn't have been a need for the civil rights movement because we wouldn't have done the thing, like Christians wouldn't have done the things that, that they were doing previously. And, and I think one of the, the sobering reflections or, or things that's kind of come home to me in, even in the last few months as I've looked back more and more over American history, and, and I don't say this as a, I say this as an outsider from the UK, but actually not as an outsider whose you know, hands are, are in any way clean because my country was thoroughly complicit in all of the above. But if we look back to this mythical time when America was, you know, a quite Christian country, I've struggled to figure out when that is, because presumably it's not during the period of, of slavery, where people were being brutalized and, and abused and, and exploited. Presumably we all agree that, that that wasn't sort of America's wonderful, high moral Christian point. It presumably wasn't in the hundred years following the abolition of slavery when segregation and Jim Crow laws were in place and, and black Americans were continuing to face ex explicit, open, legal uh, repression and, um, and abuse. And that takes us to the 60s. And I think for, for many white evangelicals, it's easy to look back to the 60s as the time when everything started to go wrong, you know, the sexual revolution, then we have Roe v. Wade in the early 70s and, and abortion sort of fully legalized across all states. It's sort of easy to sort of hanker back to a time before the 60s when everything was, was so much better. But I did, that, that, that isn't true if we actually recognize how black Americans um, and other Amer Americans of color were being treated before then. And on the one hand, I think we need to, to take time to properly lament that. And on the other hand, I think it should actually make us more hopeful about today and the opportunities we have now to do something much better, more biblical and more beautiful than our parents or grandparents or great-grandparents did. I'm, I'm very into my Harry Potter <laughs> metaphors, so you might have to forgive me this one, Colin, but um, for those who are familiar with the Harry Potter series, that there's one story arc where Harry has watched his, his godfather, Sirius Black, almost have his soul sucked out of him by a bunch of dementors. And at the last minute, when it looked like there was no hope left, from the other side of the, the lake in the darkness, this figure conjured a, a Patronus spell and sent this like, incredible, sort of, I think it was a stack, sort of charging across the lake, drove off the Dementors, saved the day. And in the course of the story, Harry comes to believe that the person who cast that spell and put everything right was his father, who's, who died when he was a baby. He's like, somehow my dad managed to be there and he did this amazing thing. And then towards the end of the story, it turns out that actually, no, it was Harry who did that. He has to go and back in time and, and he, he's the one who's casting the spell. So it looked a bit like his father, because in fact, it, it was him. And I think we're at a moment in history now where we have the opportunity as followers of Jesus to stand shoulder to shoulder with brothers and sisters in the black church, with brothers and sisters in, in immigrant majority churches, with, with brothers and sisters um, coming from, from China and putting their trust in Jesus, as so many thousands are doing. We have the opportunity now to stand shoulder to shoulder and do better than our, our forebears actually ever did. It's encouraging, Rebecca. I like that. One thing that makes a lot of this difficult in the American context in particular is a simple timeline. Um, you look back and American self-identity is most powerfully shaped by World War II and by the tremendous economic uh, growth and success that comes out of that for the United States and a sense of, of uh, unimpeachable moral righteousness. Um, of, of defeating these enemies of fascism and imperialism. And then you put that right next to communism and, you know, godless, atheistic, 
communism, and you can see that American self-identity. And so, especially for white Americans, and of course, America's military was segregated in World War II, there's a tremendous cognitive dissonance that comes with how can you be this morally upright, you know, global power that's fighting against atheism and fighting against tyranny and fascism, and yet still harboring versions of domestic terror, um, and obviously segregation and subjugation domestically. It just, we've never resolved that, that dynamic. It's just, it's very hard, not for African Americans, they're more clear eyed on this for obvious reasons, but, but for white Americans, it's simply very, very, very difficult. And that's one of the many reasons, as you've already been saying here, why I think your book is, is so helpful to do that because you cast it in a sense of why that's necessary for us to do so as Christians, as part of our evangelistic calling to be able to, to love our neighbors and to share the gospel with our neighbors who are admittedly very confused themselves about how these things are supposed to hold together. Now, one of the other things you, you write in here, Rebecca, is, is you say that to show where progressives are wrong, we must also freely acknowledge where they are right. But Rebecca, wouldn't that trick people into thinking that we can and even should learn from each other? <laughs> I, I'm a big fan of learning from each other, <laughs> but I'm actually an even bigger fan of learning from the Bible. <laughs> and if, if my non-Christian friends want to say things and believe things that I also believe from the scriptures, that's great news. That's, that's not something, my job is not to differentiate myself from my non-Christian neighbor on every possible question. And the more that I've learned and read, even actually from non-Christian scholars and historians in recent years, and I feature some of this in the book, the more I've understood that actually a lot of the beliefs and values of our non-Christian friends have come to them from the Bible as well. They just don't know it. So the, the the moral soil that undergirds any and all of the claims that you'll see on these yard signs is the idea that all human beings are equally morally valuable and that the, the rich and the strong and the powerful do not have the right to trample on the poor and the weak and the marginalized, but actually must care for, for folks on, on the margins of the society, society for, for folks in minorities of, of, of various kinds. And the, the idea that men and we, women are equally morally valuable, the idea that that there should be justice and that human beings should expect to participate in that that call to justice, that drive for justice, that, that we should have that longing for justice in our hearts. All of these things come from Christianity. And so when I say in order to show where our, our progressive friends are wrong, we must also freely admit they're right. This is not a kind of concession to any progressive agenda it's a simple attempt to be faithful to what Jesus says. And I think when we, when we start to, to do that, we see that there are opportunities to, to build the right kinds of bridges with our, our non-Christian friends and to say, hey, I know that you deeply believe in universal human rights. I know you deeply believe in racial justice and equality for women in, in care for the, the most marginalized. These things have come from Christianity. I believe these things as well. And this is why I think that, that Christianity actually gives us the, the best foundation for these ideas and gives us guidance in terms of how they should play out, which may land us in very different places. I mean, one of the ironies on the yard sign is that claim that women's rights are human rights. And I want to say to some, on one level, yes, and our men, women's rights are human rights. But if you define women's rights, if you sort of put as the central plank of women's rights, the right to abort an unborn child, you're actually undermining the, the basis for women's rights in the first place, um, because women's rights come from this biblical idea that human beings, male and female, are made in the image of God and are equally morally valuable before him. It's not a self-evident truth. It's not something that science tells us. It's not something that sort of comes from any other particular source. It comes from the scriptures. And those same scriptures say that the, the, the weakest and the, the most vulnerable are actually central to God's moral concern, and that includes unborn babies. So rather than letting abortion stand as the central plank of, of women's rights, I think actually the cross needs to stand as the central plank of women's rights. The, the most powerful expression of God coming and, and being one with us, um, the, the true image of the invisible God um, coming and, and taking the most vulnerable place in society on the cross and, and changing the way that women were seen from then onwards. 
I love the language you use there, Rebecca, of the best foundation, because I think that sets up the, the argument and the discussion very well. Let me push you here as an interviewer and say best or also only basis. Well, I've learned a whole lot from the fascinating and at times infuriating book um, by Yuval Noah Harari, Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind. I think it came out in, in 2015 or maybe 2014 originally. He's an Israeli historian who I believe identifies as an atheist himself. And he's, he's seeking to give us a history of, of humanity with the assumption that there is no God. And he'll make some pretty stark and bold claims on the basis of that, including the idea that making the claim that human rights are a figment of our fertile imaginations. He says the homo sapiens have no natural rights, just as chimpanzees, hyenas and spiders have no natural rights. He, he quotes the Declaration of Independence. Um, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. He says, the Americans got this idea from Christianity. But if we don't believe in the Christian myths about God creating people in his image, then why would we believe in universal human equality? And he, as, as well as Tom Holland, British historian, who, who wrote that amazing um, history of 2000 years of Christianity in the West, Dominion, how the Christian revolution remade the world. You know, both of those guys, they, they have different angles and, and flavors uh, and, and responses to the reality that Christianity is responsible for our what seem today to be self-evident truths, moral truths. Um, but both of them agree that it's only because of Christianity that we believe these things. And so if, if human rights are only a figment of our fertile imaginations, then the claim that women's rights are human rights is kind of pointless. I mean, if there are no human rights, then it's not really worth making that claim. And we can say that, okay, so maybe it doesn't make sense, but it's still intuitive. Only intuitive because of the residue of Christian imagination in the culture. I want to know how you disentangle this. Explain the dynamics around oppression as moral authority. Oppression as moral authority. From right to left in our culture, it seems like I cannot get a hearing unless I can blame someone for robbing me of my rights, my freedom, my election, my whatever. Mm. Disentangle that for us. One of the important insights that we, we frankly should get from just living as human beings in the world, but we can also derive from, from various sort of more academic sources, is the, the reality that we actually need to listen to other people and to take the time to see the world a little bit through their eyes if we're going to understand the full picture. Because you and I inevitably, you know, we're shaped by our, our lives and experiences, uh, you know, good, bad and, and ugly. And so much as we'd like to think that we are purely rational agents who see everything clear eyed and um, utterly um, rationally, unlike everybody else around us, the reality is we're, we're very shaped by the communities in which we live. And I think you're right in diagnosing that on, on both sides of, of you know, recent political questions, that there have been folks who are sort of saying, you know, we are being silenced, we are being um, oppressed, our voices are not being heard, justice is not being done for us. And I think sometimes that's true. And, and we need to be careful, especially those of us who, who honestly, you know, like me, I've lived a very privileged life in, in many ways. And so I need to be hesitant about quickly just kind of shutting other people down when they're saying that. So sometimes I think it's true. Other times, I think even while we're accusing other people of having a kind of victim mentality, we too ourselves can have a, a victim mentality. One of the things that I'm still adjusting to having moved from the UK to the US is the sheer, um, in many ways, like the sheer size and influence of evangelical Christianity here, which in my country isn't true. Um, and I was shocked, I was reading the New York Times this morning and, and um, it, it featured a, a recent news, news article about a very prominent evangelical leader, uh, leader leaving her denomination. And I thought, gosh, in the UK, this would not be mainstream news. People are just not that interested in evangelicals in the UK, broadly speaking. Um, and, and, and here they are. So I think sometimes it's easy, especially for those of us who you know, identify as evangelicals, to, to feel very kind of beleaguered and marginalized when actually our voice is, is probably much bigger and stronger than, than we realize. So to go back to your original question, I, I, think, I think it's right to, to pay attention to people if they're saying they have been uh, oppressed. I think that's especially important. And again, I, I'm still kind of playing catch up my, myself even um, when it comes to 
patterns of abusive behavior that, that churches and Christian organizations have allowed to, to continue. I think we need to, we do in meaningful and important ways, need to listen to victims and to take seriously what's, what's said. At the same time, we need to be careful not to um, inhabit a world where we ourselves almost desire a victim status in order for our, our voices to be heard. I want to give an example of exactly what I do have in mind, because you did a great job there, Rebecca, of just talking about how incredibly complicated this is of, okay, so one of the reasons we're talking so much about oppression and victimhood is because of real oppression and real victims who are only now gaining their voice to be able to talk about these things. Okay. We're also talking about this now because of Christianity, because Christianity is what values the weak and values the poor. And there was no intrinsic value to those statuses in the Roman Empire before Christianity. So at once, this is an eminently Christian phenomenon that we should be embracing. And yet at the same time, somebody I know and love whispered into my ear on January 6, 2021, I wish I were in the Capitol building with those people. Why won't anyone just listen to them? It was a narrative of oppression. I'd imagine a lot of the people, if they're listening now and they have one of these signs in their yards, they saw the people on January 6 as the oppressors. But that's not how they saw themselves. They saw themselves as the oppressed, as the marginalized, as the weak, as those whose election had just been stolen. And what it speaks to is that the currency of moral authority is oppression. And you, you simply cannot get a hearing without that. But then it, it weasels its way in to make the oppressors position themselves as the oppressed. Right. Well, so, so here's, here's what one of the things <laughs> that concerns me about that, that whisper into your ear, Colin. And one of the things that I found uh, disturbing and distressing on January the 6th and around it, you kind of have to choose your narrative. Either the election was stolen from you because actually the majority of people who voted voted with you, in which case you're actually part of the majority, you're not part of the oppressed minority. <laughs> yeah. Or you're part of an oppressed minority and the democratic system isn't working for you because the majority of people don't side with you. And so you need to take some other kind of action. I don't actually know how you can hold both those things together. It's just not coherent. This is, this is what I've been trying to figure out for the last five years, Rebecca. Somehow, many evangelical Christians have convinced themselves that they simultaneously hold every level of power in the government as they did in 2017 and 18, and at the same time are incredibly persecuted. And it's simply confusing to try to disentangle that. And But my point is not to single out just that group of people. Simultaneously, you will hear from the left, of course, we dominate media, and we dominate the academy, and we dominate um, now, sports, we, we dominate all of these spheres of culture, and yet we are the persecuted, oppressed ones. How are we supposed to figure out, wait, who is the oppressed here? Because Christians think they're the ones being oppressed because the government is leveraging their power to be able to foist these views of a minority on a population. But obviously, transgender people feel as though they are persecuted and pressed because their number one talking point is the suicide rates for transgender people as the justification for why they should be treated differently. So I just find these overlapping oppression narratives to be incredibly difficult to disentangle. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so just before, can, can we talk about transgender questions in just a minute? Because yeah. I want to give a different <laughs> we'll answer back. to your first question. So your first question was, okay, I'm, what I'm seeing is people both, to oversimplify things, both on the, on the right and on the left, saying that they're on the side of the oppressed, whether that's them personally or folks, those for whom they're advocating. Good point. Yeah. Yep. Now, what drives me crazy is that, broadly speaking, folks on neither of those ends are actually listening to a category in America who legitimately have been most systemically oppressed, 
which is black women. Yeah. Now, if folks on, on the religious right were to listen to black women in America, they would find they are the most likely people in America to identify as Christians. They're the most likely people to show up to church on a Sunday. They're the most likely people to read their Bibles to pray. They're most likely people to hold core evangelical beliefs. And actually, they're some of the least likely people to affirm LGBT identities. So that's what folks on the right would realize, is that this uh, doubly oppressed category of folks in America, broadly speaking, are actually in exactly the same place as they are on many important issues and questions of belief. So why are they so alienated from them? Well, then we need to take a hard look at our, ourselves and the history of racism in America. Folks on the left, likewise, need to, need to listen to the voices of black American women who, who they all day long would say are some of the most important voices to listen to who have been historically silenced, and that's true. But actually today, are my white liberal secular progressive friends really listening to the majority of black women in this country who own Jesus as their savior and would actually like to, to spread that news to others. Like, not really. And here's what I've noticed is happening. And it's almost like it's a kind of conspiracy on both, both ends or a marriage of convenience between the, the left and the right. In both, it's in both interest of both sides to only platform progressive black voices. Now, I don't want to say that there's, there should be no platforming of progressive black voices and that there, there should be no you know, room to, to hear from, from black people, for example, who would be affirming of LGBT identities, um, maybe black Christians who affirm those things. Like, I think it's important to, to hear from those folks, sure. However, we must recognize that is not the majority view of black Americans or in particular of black Christians. And when we only hear representative voices, sort of seemingly representative voices, um, we only hear the kind of black voices that are honestly palatable to white liberals. We're doing the very thing that my white liberal friends would hate to realize that they're doing, which is silencing the voices of black Americans. But equally, I think it's convenient, sadly, for some of my white brothers and sisters in Christ, it's convenient to not hear from Bible believing black Americans because then it really is about the history of racism in this country. And it's not about a kind of progressive takeover of, or, you know, silencing of the Bible. So that's to your, to your first question. I like, I want to uh, underscore for people that you used an intersectional category reference there to doubly oppressed. Okay. So now yeah. we've, we've checked off critical theory. Now we've checked off intersectionality. So everybody can go ahead and cancel us on the right after this. But here's, here's what I get at with intersectionality. It is very easy to turn intersectionality on its head as a Christian and ask very hard and illuminating questions. So, for example, when the intersectional oppression of sex or sexism or homophobia or transphobia or whatever intersects with race, Mm -hmm. which category wins? And right now, race loses. Action. Every single time race loses. Right. And, and this, is, this is how we've, this is why I think we're in this position where we are only, uh, when I say we, secular progressive folk only want to hear from, uh, sorry, secular progressive white folk only really seem to want to hear from black people who agree with them. And they don't want to, <laughs> they don't, well, I think honestly, I think they just don't know. But that is not the majority view of, of black Americans and certainly not the majority. But they would know if they asked. Indeed. Indeed. I'm just, I'm trying to be, I'm, I'm being yeah. gracious. I actually no, I don't think, I don't think they know. And part of why they don't know is because of this conspiracy of, of the right end of the left. So, so part of what needs to happen here, Colin, I think is for those of us who care about Christianity in America, those of us who care about the, the scriptures being upheld, those who care about biblical sexual ethics, those who care about evangelism going forward, we need to get behind, support, listen to, learn from, and broadcast black Christian voices who are singing Jesus' songs. I mean, not literally, I mean, literally it would be wonderful as well, but not only to sing, but to, to speak um, for, for the gospel. And I think that's where many of us kind of need to, to do some real work, actually. 
This is why I, I'll give a specific example here. I'll credit the Anne campaign and I'll credit just tr- credit Justin Gibney here specifically. He did coming out of democratic politics in Atlanta before he founded the Anne campaign. He did what I have seen so difficult for so many others to do. He came out as a Christian with the Anne campaign against the Equality Act. And there is tremendous pressure for Democrats and for African Americans and those both those categories to go along with that. Because what I'm trying to help people to see is that the real power here is progressive sexual politics. Right. Yes, but it's fueled by the engine of of true historical injustice. So, so then again, thinking about okay, how how have we got to where we are today? Where, for example, um, not using like I think I think we're not far off a situation where me not identifying myself with my name and my preferred pronouns could be seen as sort of at best socially inept uh, amongst many of, of my friends or at, at worst you know if you're in a workplace situation um just non-permissible to not identify as you know colin he him uh, rebecca she hers so how have we got into the situation where even raising questions about transgender identity from a not not 100% affirming angle is seen as as a hateful act of essentially act of violence. I think the answer is in a couple of different places. So number one, the, the suicide attempt rates amongst transgender identified people are very high, especially amongst girls, sort of adolescent girls who are not identifying as, as female. It's uh, around 50% suicide attempt rates, which is completely heartbreaking. Whatever anybody thinks about anything, we Christians should lament that situation. From a perspective of those who who would want to say that transgender identities are are good and to be affirmed, the reason for that high suicide rate is purely down to societal oppression and not to do with any other underlying mental health uh, situations that, that these young people might be in. Now, on the other side, it's it's easy for those of us who may not agree with um, affirming transgender identities to say, well, it must purely be down to mental health issues that were already there and nothing to do with societal oppression. And I, I don't think we need to to do a sort of start either or there. But if, if if you think from the perspective of you know a, a secular friend who sees themselves as an ally of transgender people, you know, number one, suicide rates are incredibly high, and that's due to societal oppression. Number two, um, and I remember Elizabeth Warren doing this when she was um, standing as the Democratic nominee, who wanted to, to list transgender people who have been murdered in the past year. Again, is something that every Christian should lament. Anyone who's murdered, is, it's a terrible thing. <laughs> but the, the message at the moment is that transgender people are being murdered at a disproportionately high rate, again, due to societal oppression. And that this means um, that folks in this situation today are, are in, in all reasonable senses in equivalent position to black people being lynched under Jim Crow. Now, one of the problems with the narrative is that actually, as far as any data I have seen, transgender people in this country are not actually murdered at a disproportionate rate. Uh, and there was a, a study um, done at Harvard a c- couple of years ago that I, I think I, I quoted in the book where they were saying, it's possible that numbers have been miscalculated. So I'm, I, I don't want to say hard and fast, this is definitely not the case, but it is certainly not evident from any of the data that transgender people are murdered at a disproportionate rate right now. And, and sadly, many of the, the transgender people who are murdered are um, black, and which places you at a higher risk of, of homicide in this country, um, and or uh, engaging in, um, in the sort of commercial sex trade of one form or another, which again, places you at a higher risk. Again, those lives absolutely matter and should be lamented, but they're not evidence of this is, you know, a new Jim Crow situation where transgender people are being you know, murdered in the streets left and right because of that, because of being transgender. But it, it helps me to understand the, the honestly, the sort of righteous anger or the, the feeling of righteous anger that the, um, the secular ally has when they're, they're wanting to defend transgender people because in their minds, the transgender rights movement today is today's civil rights movement. And those of us, which I, I hope is all of us, those of us who look back at the civil rights movement and think, 
dear God, how is it possible that Christians were on the wrong side of that? And like, it's just heartbreaking. And, and those of us who would like to think that were we back in that situation historically, that we would have been marching on the right side, it's easy then to think, okay, what, what's our battle today? And for many folks, it's transgender identities. Now, I think the Bible pulls us in, in very different directions, as I mentioned earlier, when it comes to, to racial justice, equality and integration, and when it comes to sexual or romantic relationships or identities that, that take us out of the male-female model that, that, that the Bible gives us. So, but I, but I can see, I, I think it's important for us to understand, and this is true, honestly, in, on any issue and in any conversation. We're never going to persuade somebody else if we don't actually understand why they believe what they believe or, or why they're thinking how they're thinking. And I think we need to, as Christians, we need to work hard to understand why we believe what we believe and make sure that it's biblically based and not just what our parents or grandparents told us and we haven't measured it against the scriptures. And we need to work hard to understand why those on the sort of other side of the, the fence from us believe what they believe and where the, the seeds of that righteous anger come from. Otherwise, I, I think for many Christians today, it's just completely confusing and blindsiding because they can't see that connective tissue. And I think we need to recognize that it's there. At the same time, I, I'm honestly fascinated to see how this plays out in the coming years. But whereas in some ways the gay rights movement like went down relatively easily with you know, secular liberal folks, the transgender rights movement is a whole nother kettle of fish. Uh, and the two places that it's on a collision course, even with um, folks who would see themselves as sort of secular liberals, one when it comes comes to um, feminist thinking and two when it comes to traditional sort of gay and lesbian thinking so i, I mentioned in my book that jk rowling has has been by many people cancelled because she doesn't want to say that transgender women are women in all the respects um that that, that statement could be true so for example you know, where is she in expressions which honestly would have been completely normal kind of liberal fare a few years ago, you know, she would say she has no problem with somebody who is biologically male, dressing as a woman, uh, using a female name, expecting to engage with others as a woman. And in the vast majority of instances, she does think that there are certain spaces that should be reserved for women. For example, women's prisons, women's um, shelters for, for women fleeing domestic abuse. Um, I think women's sports teams, there's some real sort of controversy around biological males participating in, in, in women's sports and um, Daniel Radcliffe who played Harry Potter in, in the series you know came out sort of against J.K. Rowling on this and said transgender women are women that's kind of the shibboleth of the the movement right now like if you you need to be able to say that be truly on board and to be truly sort of one one of the I'd say one of the boys but that's sort of slightly unfortunate expression the problem is once you say that a that a biological male is in every respect able to be as much a woman as I am, we've actually ripped the heart out. We don't know what the word woman means. We've ripped the heart out of the definition of a woman. And we've all we've really got left is stereotypes. If for years, feminists, and I, I talk in the book a little bit about feminism, because I think Christians have, to some extent, thrown babies out with bathwater when it comes <clears throat> to feminism. And there are things that we as Christians really should affirm in the midst of feminism and other things that we shouldn't. And we need to think more carefully than we have. But just at the basic level to say, okay, if my female body does not is not what defines me as a woman then what does is it is it having long hair is it wearing a skirt is it enjoying some things more than other things we've actually we've ended up in a situation where if we affirm sort of cutting edge of transgender thinking we've taken decades of steps back in terms of giving women in particular but men as well you know girls and boys the freedom to be male or female in a you know in the way that that suit fits the best. We're in a situation where if you're really, really, really a boy, then you'll dress a certain way, you know, play with trucks and not dolls, et cetera, et cetera. If, I must say from a Christian perspective, actually, I know I'm a woman, however much I may or may not. I mean, I, I frankly, there are many traditionally female things that I don't really jive with. Like I'm, I don't like wearing makeup. I don't, I, I don't enjoy shopping. I'm not into a lot of the sort of traditionally feminine things. It's just not. That's okay because something the Bible said that I should be. And in fact, God created me with a woman's body. That's kind of what I need to know about the situation. I think there's something tremendously liberating about that. But there's the there's a clash with traditional feminists, I think, in today's um, transgender thinking. And there's also, interestingly, a clash with, with some traditional kind of gay and lesbian activists who are saying, you know, number one, um, 
they should be allowed to define themselves as same sex attracted and not be accused of being transphobic if they're saying, you know what, I'm actually not attracted to men who identify as women or women who identify as men. <laughs> we've written we've written on that recently at the Gospel Coalition, and this yeah. is the reason for the dramatic uptick in bisexual identity. Because if you're seen as only preferring, if a woman and only preferring a woman, that's seen as being transphobic. Well, I th- I'm sure that's part of the story. I think it's also a reality that bisexual people are by far the largest proportion of same-sex attracted people that there are, just experientially. So it may be a more comfortable identity, but it's also just the truth. Yeah. But then that would, but then that would correct me if I'm wrong here. Then Rebecca, that would also then extend to the removal of the convenient fiction of a fixed preference for most people. So that um, is a, a woman called Lisa Diamond, who I wrote about in *Confronting in Christianity*, and, and I'm quoting again in, in this book because she's very interesting. She's a, a lesbian herself. Um, a professor at University of Utah who studies um, sex and psychology in, in various forms. And she has been writing for a while now on researching sexual fluidity, the reality that people, some people have a, a experience a very kind of fixed pattern of attractions to where they're only attracted to men or only attracted to women. And that's kind of the story of their whole life. Other people actually experience change over time and it can go in either direction. So it could be, you know, as a teenager, you actually found yourself very much drawn to people of your same sex and then later in adulthood you kind of end up being actually very sort of comfortably heterosexual or it can go in the other direction um so i don't think that's especially news but it is news that i mean i think we're, we're catching up on the news at the moment in that respect the idea that somebody is just born with a fixed sexual identity or sexual orientation is is not the leading thinking now of um, you know folks who would identify as as gay or lesbian and a real expertise here. Which was a surprise when somebody in my life identified as transgender and said, "I'm sorry, but you can't say anything about this because this is a fixed identity." And I thought, "Wait a minute, no." I mean, that, that, that's that's not even what transgender activists are saying today. Well, well, some are and some aren't. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot of there's a lot of crosstalk, uh, and I, what I've tried to do in the book is rather than just high-level summarize things, I've tried to quote from specific people and specific organisations and say, "Hey, this is this is what these folks right now are saying," um, and I don't want to misrepresent them. I just want to hear from them right now and, and understand that that there is a lot of confusion because you know the statement "transgender women are women." Well. You can't hold that together with the idea that somebody could have a a growing and changing and, and dynamic sort of sense of their own gender, which is also something that is is often voiced by by folks who are advocating for transgender rights. You identified Rebecca two of the collisions: feminist uh, collisions, gay lesbian, uh, just the, those those collisions. I'll add a, a third one, which is parental rights. Um, that's a whole different deal. For It's one thing for your child to grow up and to come out of the closet as gay or lesbian. It's a whole nother thing to be faced with the questions about gender therapies, hormone treatments, uh, sex assi- reassignment surgeries for preteens or teenagers. And of course, in your native UK, that's been the major controversy there as well. And I think it'll continue because you would have thought this is just going to sail through. But it ran into that problem, and all of a sudden, NHS is saying, "Wait a minute are are we are we doing this? Are we doing? I mean, what age and what sort of consent is required for this?" And and also, there was very little understanding of the permanent psychological and biological effects. Yeah, I mean, we do need to ask ourselves: if somebody is not old enough to vote, are they old enough to make decisions that will render them permanently infertile? For example, like. That's or, or will mean that they would never be able to breastfeed a baby if they would have a baby one day. I, I think, yeah, there are, there are real causes for concern, even for folks who who don't have any um, like other reasons, sort of moral questions over over transgender identity. I, I think it's also important for us as Christians, and I try to to clarify this in the book, to distinguish between things which are things that that Christians shouldn't 
do themselves. Yeah. And um, things that we should spend a lot of time and energy making sure other people don't do. Yeah. So, um, and I, I think there are there are complex questions there. But somebody, for example, could strongly believe what the Bible says about sexual ethics and say that you know, a Christian should only have sex with somebody they're married to who's of, of the opposite sex. And at the same time, they could say, yeah, I think that non-Christians who are in gay marriages should have legal protections. I think right. sometimes we, we've we've smushed these things completely together. And what, I, what I'm often saying to my kids is, hey, you know, Jesus's people should live differently from from people who are not following Jesus. And we shouldn't we shouldn't expect or, or impose or enforce sort of Christian ethics on, on folks outside the church in a broad brush kind of way. Sometimes we should. I mean, I'm not saying in every, like, uh, to some extent, as we touched on earlier, all ethics ultimately are going right. to spring from one source or another. And, and um, you know, I think Christianity is the foundation you know, ultimately for, for much of our legal system. So I'm not saying has nothing to do with laws, but I think also it's important for us to distinguish between, hey, it's vital for me to live this way under Jesus, to encourage my brothers and sisters in Christ to live a certain way under Jesus. It doesn't necessarily mean it's vital for me to kind of fight to make sure that nobody else lives in that way. Um, I may often be in a more faithful position if I'm showing love to people outside the church who have made choices that Christians shouldn't make and um, inviting them to consider Jesus. I think, Rebecca, if I understand you correctly and understand this book, which I'm excited about, I think people can tell that, it's that if you see this sign in your neighbor's yard, it's probably not an invitation to egg the house or to go over and start screaming about politics or debating about gay marriage, as an example. It's an invitation. I I see it as like a a huge evangelize me sign. In the neighbor's yard, because these are people who are thinking about important and ultimate things, and they're willing to stand for publicly for what they believe in, which means to me, that means then they'd be willing to answer some questions that I might have. And so they, and as you and I know, Rebecca, from evangelizing, one of the best ways to initiate an evangelistic conversation with somebody is to simply ask them questions about what they believe. That's the most natural place to be able to start. And rare is the person for whom you would do that, who would not then think, oh, why is this person asking me these questions? I wonder what this person thinks. It's a, it's an invitation to dialogue. It, it, it keeps the conversation going. So, at least as I understand your book, that's the spirit. Yeah, and I think often as Christians seeing signs like that, we tend to go one of two ways. We'll either look at the sign and think, well, that sign includes some things that I know the Bible doesn't affirm. And so I want to knock it down. I want to get out my hammer and I want to swing it, like not necessarily literally, but at least in terms of my thinking and how I want to raise my kids and how I want to engage my neighbors. All of this has got to go because some of it I can see doesn't fit with the scriptures. And then there'll be other folks who'll look at a sign like that and think, okay, I'm, I'm deeply aware of the history of, of injustice toward Black Americans and the ways in which Christians, like white Christians, have been tragically complicit in that. And I've been told that this is all a package deal together. That if if I affirm that Black Lives Matter, then I also must affirm that that love is love and that um, transgender identities are as valid as as any other, um, and that abortion is every woman's right. Like all of these things hang together. And so I, I can't kind of pick and choose from this menu of potential beliefs. And I actually think both of those fall massively short of what the Bible calls us to. I think instead we sort of need to get our, our ideological sharpies out and think, okay, let's look at each of these issues on its own terms and understand what Christians do and don't affirm within this so that we're then in a position to disentangle it both in our own minds and in, in conversation with friends um, and, I, and I think honestly if we on if we're not willing to acknowledge and affirm and repent of the ways in which at least for those of us like me who are white evangelicals the ways in which our our sort of theological forebears have massively sinned when it comes to race I don't think anyone should really listen to us about anything else like I think actually that's a place where, where progressive folk are right but just as the, the way that we become Christians in the first place is to repent of our sin, I don't, I don't think it should disturb us if we find ourselves needing to repent of our sin. In fact, 
if we're going to our non-Christian friends and saying, hey, you have a whole lot of sin to repent of, and I'm not willing to repent of my own sin or the sin of my sort of tribe, what kind of witness is that? It's, it's certainly not what the Bible calls us to. I mean, I, I love how Paul, in his first letter to Timothy, you know, right after uh, talking about um, gay relationships as being something that, that is a, against God's law, and along with some other, you know, a whole b- bunch of other things that he was saying against God's law, he says, this is a trustworthy saying worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. If we don't go into every conversation about those yard signs or anything else, knowing that we are the worst sinner we know most probably, I don't think we've we barely grasped the gospel for ourselves. So why would we think that we can share it with anybody else? If you're discipling teenagers, especially juniors and seniors, I think in high school, get this book. <laughs> if you're doing college ministry, get this book. You're discipling young adults, get this book. I think Rebecca's given you a good example of what the problem is for a lot of young people who are trying to work through what they're learning about the hypocrisy of so many previous generations of Christians, including our own as well, on top of all of the different messages they're hearing, especially on sexual issues, that are contrary to what they've been learning from their families as Christians and their churches. This challenge of disentangling these forms of diversity, I think, is one of the most urgent discipleship challenges for young people today. And I think um, you guys have gotten a glimpse on Gospel Bound today of um, the kind of conversations Rebecca and I have fairly often. (laughs) As, As editor and publisher and author, I have the privilege of being able to hear these ideas from Rebecca and learn from Rebecca, as I have here, as I have for years, and to be able to share them with others. So, I encourage everybody to check out the Secular Creed Engaging Five Contemporary Claims. You can pick it up at the Gospel Coalition from our store, store store.thegospelcoalition.org, as well as everywhere else you're going to find those books. Rebecca, I got three quick questions for you here in the end, okay? Go for it. All right. Where do you find calm in the storm, Rebecca? Oh, well, Jesus, obviously. Um, You know, it's so so nice to have, and I, I, I... I truly prize this and thank God for it. Um, I have a handful of people in my life, of whom my husband is one, but not the only one. I think that's important. Who know me and love me, who know the most embarrassing, shameful secrets that I have um, and love me still. And who, as and when I completely bomb in the public square or get cancelled by every possible platform, will still love me and still be here. And I I find that immensely uh, calming and comforting in, in all storms that I have, I have Jesus and I have his arms around me in the arms of um, a handful of people I'm really close to. I love that, Rebecca. And also because, you know, we're all going to get canceled at some point. So it's just inevitable. It seems. <laughs> so might as well prepare for it now. We never know. Um, where do you find good news today, Rebecca? I'm a complete optimist. So I do see hope in all sorts of situations. And in particular, I see hope in the fact that black Americans and and immigrants from places not like Europe actually are preaching the gospel loud in this country today. Uh, I I sometimes sort of have to remind people that immigration isn't eroding America's Christian heritage. It's actually a blood transfusion for the American church. And the kind of immigrant you want to pray would come to your country is actually not a white European like me. So there's a small chance they'll bring the gospel with them like I, like I did. Um, But you actually, you're much better off with, with folks from um, Latin America and from from Africa and increasingly from China. Um, And and if people are coming here and not bringing Jesus with them, that's also great news because it means that we can share the gospel with them. So I find, I find hope in what God's doing in his multiracial, multiethnic, multicultural church. I love that, Rebecca. Last question for you. What's the last great book you've read? I've almost finished reading Homegoing. Oh, was this yeah, your first time? Yeah, you love as well. Yeah, oh. no, well, I read Transcendent Kingdom first. Oh, Homegoing is so much better, I think. What did you I think? Don't know. I, I, I'm not sure I can do, I'm not sure I can say, actually. Well, they're, they're very different. I found both of them really moving and challenging and, and, and fascinating and heartbreaking. And I think especially... There's a chapter in Homegoing um, where we see life through the eyes of an enslaved woman who is assigned uh, an enslaved husband who's sort of 
brought fresh from Africa, doesn't speak English yet, uh, they they develop a kind of unlikely love between them and they um, get pregnant with a little boy. I'm going to spoil this chapter, but it, maybe it'll be a taster for folks who haven't read it and need to. Um, they then decide to try and escape for the sake of their son, actually. And while they're trying to escape, they realize that they're going to be caught. And so they give their son to the woman who's helping them escape. I mean, it's just, you can't even think about it without tears. And he gets out and they don't. And when they get back, she is beaten within an inch of her life and then forced to watch her husband hanged. And that, that is some of the history that we must recognize and lament if we're followers of Jesus. I, I, I've commended that book so many times. And for the reasons I got before you, when you were just starting to talk about that, I started to get chills. You start crying. I mean, that, that's the kind of book that it is, which, uh, I mean, got to be one of the, uh, of course, Yajasi comes out of Alabama. Um, let me see where she grew up. East. I mean, she's, of course, an immigrant family, comes from an immigrant family, but grew up here in Alabama. Seven figure advance for that book. And now you can know why. Um, I've not read anything more helpful getting the full scope of African American history, especially. And it's so helpful because so much of it is related to the UK and their role, but also the United States, the American South, but also New York City. And the whole book defies any simple, clean cut narrative that anybody brings to the table on racial discussions. Yeah. And then the, the um, Transcendent Kingdom, the reason I, I love that book so much, or part of it, was the, the wistfulness that that the main character voices about the loss of Christian faith. Both books, I think, show how Christianity has been a lifeline for Black Americans for, for centuries and for decades, and how, how poignant that is and, and how heartbreaking it is to see somebody like the, the main character in, in Transcendent Kingdom, um, who can't be a million miles away from Yaki Yasi in some respects, uh, you know, personally and biographically, feeling like they have to abandon Christianity, but actually not being satisfied with any alternative. Well, now we're going to hold separate podcasts, <laughs> just on <laughs> these two books. But you, you gave language, Rebecca, to what I have been struggling to understand, because I've been trying to uh, understand the author's perspective, because she's not writing from, she's not writing as a Christian, I don't think, does not, does not seem to be, she's writing as a Christian. She seems to be writing as somebody who was raised Christian, at some level, um, I think I've seen from a biographer, her dad was not a Christian. If I remember correctly, I could be wrong on this. So somebody can correct me out there on this. But you're right, the wistfulness, because in the end, it's, it's, the, it's the mother-daughter relationship in Transcendent Kingdom. The mother who is working through all this tragedy through by her faith in a white church, white Pentecostal church, and the daughter is just disconnect with that. And then homegoing, I find a parallel there in the mother whose son is lost to drugs in New York. Same thing, holding on to that just last thread of hope through, through Christ while her family just disintegrates around her. And, th and that's the, it's real to what real people are going through. And it, and it talks about just that, that dynamic of faith, especially within African-American communities that I'm peering in on and just very gripped by of that faith that sustains but that is hard to sustain in an atmosphere of ongoing suffering and oppression and just a legacy of, at best, confusion of the relationship between Africans and Christianity. Did I summarize some of that? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, the hard to sustain bit is where I just sort of have a question mark because I think you see you see some people going the way of, of Yogi Az's main character in Transcendent Kingdom of saying, you know, when, her, when she lost her brother to opioid addiction, she also lost her faith in God. But then I, I think you see other people in the midst of the most terrible suffering who uh, I wrote about Fanny Lou Hamer recently in a, in a chapter in a book and unrelenting Christian faith of someone uh, who has been like brutalized by people who, white people who would own the name of Christ, but think that because she is black, she had it coming or whatever it was that they twisted thinking they had i mean her trying to witness to the jailer's wife after she's been brutally beaten in jail i mean you think jesus must be true when you see people in her position clinging on to him so hard amen i love that that optimist part 
and you, Rebecca, I've always appreciated how you and I can talk about hard, complex things, we can disagree about things. We can, you know, kind of argue through those sort of things, but I'm just always encouraged. I always learn. And you always bring that hopeful perspective in the risen Christ. And I think that's why so many people connect with your books. And so check out the Secular Creed, Engaging Five Contemporary Claims. Um, obviously, Rebecca's got two other books out as well, Confronting Christianity. And then, of course, also a youth version of that that's just come out as well. What's that one called again, Rebecca? Ten questions every teen should ask, bracket, and answer, close brackets, about Christianity. All right. I think the book is better than the title. <laughs> well, you, you uh, again, I've been privileged to be to read and to help to edit and even in some ways by your kindness to help shape your books. And that's a great privilege of, uh, of my career. So, Rebecca, again, thanks. Thanks for joining me on Gospel Bound. No, thank you. Colin. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Gospel Bound. For more information, including past episodes, transcripts, and to sign up for my newsletter, go to tgc.org slash gospelbound. If you like what you've heard, you may also like my new book written with Sarah Zalstra called Gospel Bound, Living with Resolute Hope in an Anxious Age. You can find it wherever books are sold. Music